Welcome everyone to the Goa on webinar series. We will get started in just a moment. I see some people joining. Okay, it looks like we've had some attendees join. Thanks everyone for signing on this morning. Um, thank you for joining us for this edition of the Goa on webinar series. My name is Sarah Flickinger and I'm an associate research scientist at the International Atomic en Energy Agency, OAICC. I'll be moderating today's webinar, which is titled Molecular Basis and Behavioral Adjustments Reveal Potential Local Adaptation to Acidifying Oceans, a Lesson from Natural Analogs. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the four organizations that sponsor this webinar series. First, Goa On, the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network. Second, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in the United States. Third, the IAEA OAICC, the International Atomic Energy Agency, Ocean Acidification International Coordination Center. And finally, the IOC UNESCO, the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. For those of you who are new to Goa On, it is a collaborative international network of almost 1,000 members from over 100 countries and territories designed to detect and understand the drivers of ocean acidification and the resulting impacts on marine ecosystems. During today's presentation, all participants are in listen-only mode. You are welcome to type any questions into the Q&A box, which can be found at the bottom of your screen in the control panel. And we will be monitoring the incoming questions and we'll pose them to our speakers uh, during the question and answer section, which will begin immediately after the presentation. During this time, you can also raise your hand by clicking on the button at the bottom of your screen, and we will call on you to unmute and ask your question. Uh, at this time, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. First, we have Dr. Davide Spadafora. Davide is a postdoctoral researcher in a joint project between the University of Tsukuba and ICONA, the International CO2 Natural Analogs Network. Davide's research interests focus on understanding the impacts of environmental changes on marine communities. Currently, he is particularly interested in pre predicting the potential for fish behavioral and physiological local adaptation to projected future ocean conditions at CO2 seeps. We also have with us Professor Timothy Ravasi. Tim is a professor of marine science and the principal investigator of the Marine Climate Change Unit at OIST an adjunct professor at the Australian Research Council Center of Excellence for Coral Reef Studies at the James Cook University. Tim's research interest lies on the current status of coral reef ecosystems. He is particularly interested in looking at ecologically relevant issues in the light of rapid environmental change, such as climate change. I would like to give a very warm welcome to our speakers and without further ado, I will turn it over to them for the presentation. Oh, hello everyone, can you hear me? We can hear you fine, thank you. Can you hear me? Sorry. Yes, Davide, you, we can hear you. Oh, uh, hello everyone, thank you for joining today and thanks Sarah for the nice introduction. And uh, today uh, I would like to talk about this uh, talk in, I mean, this first part of this talk about the molecular basis and the behavioral adjustments, which can reveal potential local adaptation to acidifying oceans in species living natural situ analogs. So um, spe specifically, I will talk about the behavioral adjustments. Now, while later, uh, Timothy will explain the molecular basis, which can reveal this potential local adaptation. So uh, as mm, part of ICONA project, I uh, will just to spend two few words uh, about what ICONA project is. So it's an international network created to 
uh, increase the number of studies on the ecosystem liver response to ocean acidification using these natural analogs. Uh, in, this, in, this, in this slide, you can see in the, a few natural analogs involved in this project, for example, in Italy with the Vulcano Panarea and Ischia, also Japan with Shito, uh, Shikinejima and Iwo Torishima, uh, Palau with Iko Bay, Papua New Guinea with Ambito, and New Caledonia with Burake. But And these natural analogs are distinguished between like volcanic events, that, for example, Vulcano and Shikinejima and Ambito, and uh, we have also the semi-enclosed bays like Nico Bay and Burake. However, these are all uh, just uh, uh, parts of the natural analogs uh, all around, spread all around the world. So we hope that other natural analogs will join this network. Just now, a brief introduction, introduction about the, uh, the what fish, why fish behavior is important, because one of the first response adopted by animals to a changing environment, for example, our uh, reduced pH, pH environment is predominantly through a modification of the behavior. Uh, so acidification can affect the behavior through multiple uh, mechanisms. For example, they can uh, it can affect like the uh, GABA, uh, GABA A neuroreceptor in fish. So uh, this can have uh, important implication for the uh, behavioral response of the fish, for example, changing changes in changes in predator avoidance behavior, also for aging behavior on the reproduction of fish. Also, the acidification can affect the, uh, the acid-based regulatory mechanism of the fish. So the fish spend more energy, for example, to regulate this mechanism under this condition, instead of using this energy for in important behavioral mechanisms. So, but this behavior, uh, physiological mechanism are strictly related to the molecular mechanisms, as Timothy will explain later better. And uh, for example, the alteration of some gene, of the expression of some genes can alter, can alter sorry, the, uh, this physiological mechanism, which in turn can alter the behavior of the organisms. Uh, in the other side, we have also the indirect effect of the of, of acidification, for example, through the, the and changes in the habitat complexity, or also to changes in, in, in the availability of food resources, which can alter and the consequence in the behavior of the organisms. So, and, but uh, um, why natural analogs are important for the studies? Because natural analogs can give us information about changes in the community structure, because uh, to date, the most of the studies are, have been conducted uh, using single species. And uh, so we have not much more information about the uh, effect of acidification on the higher level of biology, biological organization, for example, community or ecosystem. They can also give information about the capacity for fish behavior adaptation or acclimatization to future ocean acidification condition. And, uh, <clears throat> Uh, because we can have information about the long-term effect of, uh, of the uh, acidification. And we also need to keep in mind that this, this fish, for example, living in natural fluctuation, fluctuating environments. So we have uh, uh, like the fluctuation of, uh, for example, pH or, and temperature, which can alter the behavior of the fish. So these are the few studies uh, conducted in natural analogs on the effect of uh, acidification in, and, and fish behavior. And um, so today, just to, I mean, let's talk about some results. So uh, I, would, uh, I would present three field-based experiments to assess the role of the behavioral plasticity and the adapt adaptive sorry, potential of these species to an acidified environment. So I use these two species because these are can considered as good models because they are exposed to the high CO2 level for at the event site for, for example, for the entire life as for the Gobus incognitus or for um, crucial phase of their life, for example, for the Ocellata duras and for Ocellatus. So in, in these studies, these three studies have been conducted in two islands, in particular in Vulcano Island. 
And these are part of the Aeolian archipelago in, uh, located in South Italy. And uh, um, so in the first two experiments, I used this species called the Symphodus ocellatus, which is a Mediterranean grass. And I uh, assessed whether the chronic exposure to the high CO2 levels can affect the fishery reproductive behavior and the spawning uh, <clears throat> performance of this uh, species. This species has a very repro complex reproductive tactics because you, um, this is, as you can see in the picture, this is the nesting male, which is the biggest one, that during the uh, breeding season that lasts from May to July, they build some nests in the rocks. Then they, they, they attract many females to the nest. The female lay the egg masses inside the eggs, and the nest male immediately fertilizes the eggs. But sometimes we have uh, some incursion from some other males, small, smaller males, called the sneakers, that try to compete with the dominant male to fertilize the eggs. But in the same time, the nesting male, nesting male is, is also involved in other important uh, activities. For example, uh, parental care activities such as fanning or guarding behavior, which are important to, uh, to ensure the well development of the hex. So um, uh, this is just a short video show um, that shows like the, the particular parental care behavior of this species. So you can see the nesting male which attract the female to the nest. The female release the egg masses and the male immediately fertilize the eggs. But as you can see, there is an incursion from the sneakers that try to compete with the uh, dominant male for these eggs. So the, in this in frame, you can see four sneakers in, going inside the nest. And uh, so in the first paper in 2016, we studied this competitive behavior, spawning behavior of these species. And we observed a significant reduction of the, uh, of the uh, spawning <coughs> event uh, by the nesting male under ICO2 condition compared to the control condition, as you can see in this, in this, uh, in this slide. And uh, while the sneaker uh, spawning behavior did not change between the two different nesting sites. Uh, this can suggest uh, like a uh, potential negative effect of the acidification on the reproductive success of these species. However, when we look at, at the dominant male paternity analysis, we observed that the proportion of the eggs fertilized by the nesting male was not different between the two different nesting sites. So suggesting that despite there is the, the, this decrease in, uh, uh, in the number of spawning events by nesting male, under ICH condition. However, the sneakers don't like, do not uh, uh, benefit of this um, impaired behavior. So uh, this may also suggest that uh, um, there are potential, uh, uh, potential local adaptation of these species, for example, due to the other mechanisms for as, such as, for example, the sperm performance that can uh, favor Certain, certain male over, other, over others, or also due to the ovarian fluid characteristics of the males. However, uh, we um, other evidences for local adaptation um, can be observed in this study conducted in 2016 by Gatton et al., where they did a transplanting experiment, and they observed that the oxygen consumption did not differ in eggs collected from the two different nesting sites. They only found difference when they um, moved the, the eggs from the control to the high CO2 condition. And <clears throat> this may suggest also potential adaptation of the eggs uh, exposed to uh, a chronic exposure to the high CO2 condition. This, this was also observed in the sides of the larvae that did not change between the different and nest inside, and, uh, but only when we they were transplanted from the control to the high CO2 condition. In the second paper, I assessed so the changes in potential changes in the uh, total reproductive behavior of the species. So what we found is that the parental care activity was significantly lower under high CO2 condition compared to the control condition. And, uh, while the other two categories involving mating and exploratory behavior 
did not change between the different instant sites. But when we look at the, at the single activities involved uh, um, in, in parental care, we observed a significant reduction only of the guardian behavior and the ICH condition compared to the control condition. And, uh, but not, for example, in funding behavior, that was our first hypothesis, because we may expect that, that uh, uh, the, the fish can increase the funding behaviors, that is the ventilation of the hags, to, uh, to ensure the, the well develop of the hags. And uh, so the, the fish also, um, in this case, this decreased garden behavior seems to not be uh, impact negatively the, in the, the, the fitness of the species. Because as, as we say, well, I said before, the sneakers males don't, don't like benefit of this reducing behavior, for example, of the garden behavior. So the fish prefer to allocate, reallocate the energy for other activities, such as carting or wandering around. So this is also supported by also a similar density of, this, of uh, the different uh, actors uh, visiting the Charlotte grass, for example, for females, sneakers, or the, um, the number of the predators that did not change between the different uh, nesting sites. So in the last uh, paper I would like to present, I assess and I whether the chronic exposure to the high CO2 level can affect the anti-predator behavior of this um, Mediterranean goby called uh, Gobius incognitus. And we um, observe the anti-predator responses in terms of, in terms of uh, swimming activity, shelter use, and distance from a shelter. We did that transplanting experiment in this case. So just to assess the short and long-term effect of acidification on the behavior of the species. So we moved the fish from, from the control to the ICO2 condition and vice versa. And we also reciprocally transplant the fish. So from ambient again to the ambient site to control this translocation, translocation effect. And uh, uh, this is just a short video showing uh, what I did. So I built this cage in the, I fixed in the bottom of the, sand, on the, of the sea and I placed two anemones that are used as shelter from, the, from this fish to avoid to be predated. And I recorded all these behavioral responses um, and we record before and after representation of a, a predator. So um, what we observed that uh, the total activity level, so the, uh, the, the time spent by the fish actively moving in the entire arena was not different between the uh, two presentation per period of the predator. So before and after presentation of the predator and also among the different CO2 translocation treatments. The same was the for, for the shelter use. And so the time spent in the shelter and also the, for the minimum distance from the shelter. But when we look at the activity close to the predator side, so when the fish are clearly moving Near the, near the side of the predator, we observed a significant reduction of the, this activity uh, when the fish was exposed to the presence of the predator compared, when the, were, uh, compared to when the fish was alone. So, but this was observed only in the in natural ambient of the species. That, uh, so this, this seems to be, uh, can be interpreted as a freezing behavior where the fish um, reduce, significantly reduce their acti this, this activity to avoid to be predated by the species, by the predator, sorry. And uh, this strategy is common in this species, but also in other similar species. But this mm, changes was not observed in another, in another, in the other two, two translocation treatments. So, uh, however, despite this reduction and uh, sorry, despite these changes in the anti-predator behavior, however, the species seems to be very well adopted to this condition, to the high search condition, because when we look at the, at the density of this species, we observe that a twofold increase of the, uh, of, the of this fish uh, under ICH2 condition compared, compared to the control side. And uh, this is in line also with a, a study conducted in uh, 2015, by Nagelkerken et al, where um, using the same species in the same location, 
and they found a threefold increase of this species under ICH condition. And this may be due to the indirect effect of elevated CO2 that, as I said, can, can increase the food abundance uh, at the vents, so can, uh, the species can benefit of, uh, um, of this increased availability of food, and so can profilicate pro, pro, um, can profilicate very well in this condition. And um, this is also supported, this uh, local adaptation also supported by a very recent study by Suresh Chattal in, in, and where also Timothy is involved. And uh, uh, where they study the brain transcriptome of this species in Vulcan Islands. And uh, they observed significant differences in, for example, in the, transcri in the transcripts encoding for the uh, re uh, circadian rhythm, also for the ion channel and transporters that are important for the acid based regulatory mechanism of, of this species and other species, of course. And also for the transcript involved in key metabolic processes, for example, glycolysis, glucogenesis, et cetera, et cetera. So this study together with the behavioral study conducted before can suggest how this, um, so all these uh, processes can be, can be very strictly correlated between each other. So uh, in conclusion, just want to say that the, the behavioral plasticity may be considered one of the most powerful way which can animals can adjust to photo ocean acidification condition. And also natural analogous experiments can increase our knowledge about how animal behavior can shape the ecological effect of ocean acidification on the ecological communities. And as I said before, a multiple approach considering, for example, molecular or physiological behavior approach are necessary to better understand our global climate change may affect the future of the population, the communities. So that's all, thank you. Okay. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Davide, for the nice introduction of Alcona and the ocean acidification problem. Uh, my name is Tim, and I'm in Okinawa, uh, Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology, but also I'm a core member of the Alcona network. I would like to thank uh, all the, you know, the organizers, the GOAN, that I believe is a very great uh, initiative, and I'm happy to here to show with you guys uh, our results. So uh, let me start to say that in, in my lab, we have a very simple question. And the question is, what's going to happen to coral reef fish in a near future climate? And uh, we don't touch only ocean acidification. We also look at higher temperature, high salinity. Of course, for uh, uh, this audience and, and this uh, seminar, I will only talk about uh, uh, what happened to fish in a lower pH or high pco 2 so, and uh, our approach are actually two kinds of approach. One is a more aquaria setting, control experiment in aquaria. And here you can see on the right side, um, uh, so we use a lot of the, uh, it, uh, the um, uh, you know, sea simulator in, uh, in um, James Cook, in uh, Townsville. And here as part of my group member performing uh, some CO2 experiment. So where we can, in this aquaria, very sophisticated, we can catch fish from the reef, bring it in the aquaria, and start to change the condition as predicted by the uh, end of the century in terms of uh, pH, for example, and, start, and then start to uh, measure uh, different physiological or behavioral comportment. The other approach, and I will talk about both of these today, is, uh, as David mentioned, uh, they use the power of national analogs uh, of future environment in order to study how fish may adapt to a, a future uh, reef, uh, you know, if uh, the thing goes really wrong at the, by the end of the century. So, uh, you know, David already introduced this. So uh, we know that uh, by study by us and other, including David, uh, that ocean acidification can affect fish physiology, behavior, life history, growth rate, and even more uh, phenotypic uh, uh, so I don't go into this too much. 
So let me start this story to say uh, that this uh, experiment that we done in a control environment in Aquaria, in particular in the Great Barrier Reef, uh, where we went uh, to this island in the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, Lizza Island, and we collect uh, a population of these uh, Spanish denzel fish, that is uh, Acanthochromis polycanthus, just a normal denzel fish that is pretty common. And uh, we test them, right, a lot of them in uh, testing for physiology, growth rate, behavior. And what we notice is that uh, some of the fish, even if it's the same population, right? Same reef, right? Uh, some of the fish, uh, they actually show tolerance here to uh, ocean acidification. So meaning if you increase the PCO2 or decrease the pH, the fish, they behave like control in the control water. But there is a, also a big proportion of fish for the same population, same species, there's actually a sensitive uh, uh, to uh, PCO2 or uh, lower pH. So they, they, they explain, for example, uh, they have a behavior of phenotype or a, a physiological phenotype. So there is a kind of standing genetic variation that somehow uh, can control the ability of a fish to uh, uh, be tolerant, sensitive to uh, ocean acidification. And here, even more so, uh, we looked at if this you know, tolerance or sensitivity is actually genetic or is a parental uh, uh, effect. And in fact, if you look on the right side here, if, uh, the, if your father, right, is tolerant to uh, ICO2, PCO2, the offspring tend to be over to uh, even also tolerant. You can see here on the blue line, there is a very nice correlation, meaning that somehow if your dad is tolerant to high PCO2, uh, the, the next generation tend to be also tolerant. So some information from the father passed through genetically to the, uh, uh, to the next generation and tell them, look, you have to be tolerant to ice. Here is another uh, totally different experiment, uh, but again, show the tolerance uh, that is genetically uh, transmitted. Uh, from one gene to another. Here is, a, uh, for example, we cross uh, non-tolerant or tolerant of uh, mother and father. Here in blue, when the tolerant is the father and the mother is not tolerant, you can see here that each dot is a fish and that's represent the entire brain transcriptome or a fish. You can see here that the tolerant, if you're part of the tolerant, your brain, at least the molecular level, your brain, tend to cluster together and have a specific signature that's correlated with the tolerance. In the other end, if your mother is uh, tolerant, but your father is not tolerant, there is not really a, a clear signal, right? So these fish tend to be sensitive. So that is, is an uh, evidence that the, the tolerance to ICO2 is actually a genetic basis. So because of this, uh, Celia, uh, Shuntet and now is in Hong Kong, she decided to do this experiment. She took the same fish I was talking about before, and uh, uh, she took the brain and she did uh, measure the transcriptome. So like uh, measure the, basically uh, the, all the transcripts that are expressed in the brain at any given time in plus and minus CO2. And to cut some of the story short, what uh, she found is that most of the genes that are differentially expressed in, if you compare tolerant versus sensitive fish, only in present of ICO2 are actually genes that are involved in the circadian clock. That was a kind of surprise for us. Well, circadian clock, why? But then we start to look around and look at other data. And actually this makes totally sense because if you look here in the right, in the left side, this is actually the fluctuation of PCO2 in a coral reef system. So during day and night, there is a big change in concentration of CO2 in a reef. Why? Because uh, you know, during the day, there is sunlight, and then the sibadinium uh, do the photosynthesis. So the coral doesn't really need to breathe you know, to heat, right? It assimilates all the nutrients from the sibadinium. But during the night, with the lack of sun, no photosynthesis, so the coral need to start to breathe and uh, spend energy and start to eat, right? by catching whatever is coming close by. So, and uh, so what we conclude on this, that uh, the fish that are tolerant 
they switch the circadian clock uh, to the night mode, even during the day, in order to compensate the ICO2 that's artificially in aquaria we induce. Right, so it's like kind of uh, you know switching the night mode in order that the acid bases change in the gills of this fish are actually uh, set it on the night mode where they develop or that are adapted for a long time uh, to a higher concentration of CO two or of CO two. So that was a very cool uh, uh, finding, and we went further. So then we say, okay, which are these genes involved? In, uh, you know, of course, we know the circadian clock, but there is a natural selection here in this fish. So we went back to uh, the same place and uh, in the Grebarer Reef, and we collect, uh, uh, first of all, we sequence here on the left uh, a chromosome scale genome, reference genome of the uh, same model species we use, the A poly. And you can see here on the left side, this is one of the most complete genome ever sequenced uh, for any fish, including zebra fish or uh, you know, uh, tilapia, all these kind of uh, model organisms. On top of that, what we did is went back and collect 300 fish, 100 fish that have been phenotyped as tolerant, and 100 uh, 150 that has been uh, phenotyped as sensitive. And we did the classical GY study, like when you do that in human population for disease versus non-disease, in this case, were tolerant versus non-tolerance, and the tolerance is, uh, uh, you know, name it uh, tolerant to uh, CO2. And what we found is that there was indeed three regions uh, in the genome of the poly, uh, at least for the fish that's a tolerant, that seem to be under selection. You can see here. Here is a, just a snapshot of how one of these regions look like. And you can see here the uh, intensity of SNPs around these genes. One of the genes in particular that uh, was mapped in, in the same area that's uh, uh, has been under selection to be tolerant and so resistant to ICO2 was this dopamine receptor. And uh, we did a uh, 3D uh, crystallography analysis where we show that the mutation actually that uh, we found in this tolerant fish it can change the conformation of the protein. And this is a, a receptor, so changing the conformation of the brain receptor. Like, uh, so it can actually change the way that is signal from the environment to the brain and hence the behavior. The dopamine receptor in other species, uh, model organisms such as uh, zebrafish, mice, and monkey, human, has been shown to be related to uh, boldness or uh, anxiety and, and this kind of thing. That is exactly what we see in this fish, uh, at least the sensitive fish, uh, where in high, where are a really nice tissue too. So this is also a very nice story that's correlated the genetic and the genomic uh, selection uh, uh, to a behavior of phenotype. So that was the experiment we done, uh, plus other, we done in uh, control environment. Of course, it's a control environment. We take a real fish, we put it in the tanks, but it's not the real world. So as David is say, so we start to explore, and thanks to also to Arcona, the power of these natural analogs, right? And in particular, the first one, we, we tested several one, White Island, New Zealand with Ivan, uh, New Caledonia with uh, Ricardo, Shikine, and uh, Iwo Toroshima with uh, the Arcona colleague like Sylvain and Ben and Davide. But in this case, I uh, presented the result that we done uh, for a CO2C, volcanic CO2C in Papua New Guinea. In particular, this Upa Uposina reef in Papua New Guinea. Here is Papua New Guinea, very close to the Great Barrier Reef, and that is the Upa Uposina uh, site. So this is how it looks like the reef. So that is what we call the current day reef, which is uh, the control site. Uh, it's very beautiful reef. Papua New Guinea is a very unspoiled uh, region of the world in the Golden Triangle. A lot of biomass, a lot of fish, a lot of coral coverage, and it is a very healthy reef. Only 300 meters away, there is a CO2 seed. You can see it here. That is the volcano bubbling CO2, dissolving in the water and decreasing the pH. That is, I think, three, maybe 500 meters away. And you can see there is also a healthy reef, but yet different. Here is uh, uh, covered by massive varieties compared to branching coral on, on the top here. 
but also there is a healthy population of fish. So hence the question, how this coral and fish, in particular in my case, fish, they can adapt to this extreme environment of future condition. So again, using the genetic power. So what we did is uh, went there and collect uh, six species of fish. And here are the fish, including the one that we tested in the laboratory in this, the, you know, the Epoly, the one that we collected from Australian. And uh, so that is the N60. So uh, the number are uh, statistically uh, sound. And uh, we, of course, we collected these species of fish at the control and the same number at the sea. And then we applied the same approach uh, we did in the, uh, in the uh, control experiment in the aquarium. So what we did is just uh, uh, collect the fish and extract the brain and sequence the brain transcriptome, then mapping against uh, the genomes or just uh, the novel assembly if the genome was not ready, we did a computational analysis to find uh, which gene are differential express or uh, another an stuff that I will tell you now. So one of the first results that uh, is uh, very striking is first of all, and not surprisingly, if you see here, that's the number of differential express genes not all the fish species, they react in the same way. Since this is the number of differential express gene of the fish collected at the seed compared to the fish collected at the control. And keep in mind, these are not big swimmers. So the fish that collected the, the seed or at the control, they normally they develop there, they born there, they develop them and stay there the entire life, okay? So it's not like tuna or groupers that they can move uh, uh, long distance. And you can see here, uh, the epoly, the one that we use also in the experiment in the, uh, in the aquaria, is the one that is, tend, to, tend to be more plastic in terms of how uh, is brain transcriptome change in response to CO2. And uh, I know it's a complicated slide and I apologize, but the other point I want to make, if you look which gene or, or across all these sea species are actually more differential expressed, again, we confirm what we saw in the, um, uh, in the aquaria, that's, um, most of the genes are involved in circadian clock, rhythm, and other immune response, response to stimuli, and so forth. So basically, what, what I want to say here, that this uh, result of the brain transcriptome in, the, in, in a real environment, in a real ecosystem, they actually corroborate what we saw in the control environment in aquaria. But that is the cool thing. When we were in PNG, uh, there was a storm, a tropical storm, very big one. But we were brave enough to dive in the storm in order to collect the fish also during the storm, both at the control and at the, uh, and at the ship side. And here I want to show you, uh, for example, this one on the left, on the right side, these are actually uh, genes that we already know they are differential express between control and seed. But now we add the storm. And you can, what happens when you have a storm on a CO2 seep that the water mixed up because there are big waves and the pH and the concentration of CO2 come down to control, right? Because now, you know, there is all this water going around. And you can see here nicely that those fish or those genes that are normally up-regulated uh, in the sea, but down-regulated in the control, during the, uh, the storm, they go back to the control uh, level. And also the genes that are downregulated have similar patterns. That is, I think is very important, this result, because show that the differential expression that we see in the brain and the molecular response that we see in the brain, or those fish that they normally live in the sea, are actually a direct cause by the uh, ICO2. Because if you remove the ICO2, PCO2, sorry, uh, and you get back to the pH, to the normal, so the, the gene expression in the brain go back to normal, right? And I think that that is a, like a, a dose response kind of uh, a result. And that is uncomfortable, right? So, because you can see it here. Another thing that uh, was very interesting in this experiment or this data is that, but then we ask the question, so, uh, are those genes that are differential expressed, like the circadian clock, the GABA receptor, uh, all the genes that also David mentioned before, are actually under selective pressure uh, in those fish that are collected at the seed compared to those collected at control? And 
the answer is yes. Most of those genes that actually are um, differentially expressed in the fish collected in the sea tend to have a high rate of mutation. So that is a sign that they may be under selective pressure uh, you know, to create some kind of adaptation. And uh, again, that can explain why those fish, they can live happily in uh, uh, that extreme environment. So in conclusion, so what I, I show you, I, I hope I show you, that we have found genomic evidence of local adaptation to IPCO2 in tropical fish community, both in experiment done controlling uh, the environment in the, in the laboratory, in the aquaria, and in national CO2 seed. Uh, and again, both aquarium experiment and national experiment, so similar fish uh, response to fish identification. And the important thing that there is a strong species specific response to fish community to IPCO2. Why this is important? Because if we say, okay, maybe fish can adapt to temperature or to IPCO2, uh, well, we have to be careful. Yes, some of the fish they do, but some they don't. So, uh, and that can change as you know, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, or shift the ecosystem or the food chain. So with that, I conclude, I would like to uh, thank uh, Phil Mand, the great Phil Mandit, which he actually started this uh, uh, ocean acidification uh, business, both on this, in the aquaria and in the experiment. I would like to thank Celia, that did most of the experiment, both in aquaria and the CO2. Now she's in Hong Kong. And of course, my colleague and friends from uh, the Acona, uh, member like Sylvain, Bern, Shigaki, Davide, and, and so forth, James, and so forth. So I also would like to thank OIST and the, the GSPS for finding, and Icona for finding this uh, uh, work. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you so much, Tim and Davide, for those really wonderful presentations. Um, I see we have a little bit of time here for questions. Um, so I'd like to move on to the question and answer portion of this webinar. Um, we have a raised hand um, from Simzia. So I'm going to unmute you and you can um, ask your question to our speakers. Simzia, are you there? Okay, we don't seem to be able to hear you. So uh, feel free to type your question into the chat box if you're able to. Um, and we'll move on to our next question, um, which is from uh, Sam DuPont. Um, Sam, go ahead and, and unmute yourself. Okay. All right, here we go. Can you hear us? We can, excellent. Fantastic. So I'm here with the, a course in Monaco on multiple stressors. So thanks, Tim and Davide, for a really nice talk. Uh, so we, we're going to talk about it after during the course. So that's great. My question is like, fr from what you have, do you think there is enough standing genetic variation in the species you study to cope with future environmental changes? Uh, I guess, uh, hi, Sam, good to hear from you, by the way. Uh, it's been a long time. Uh, well, uh, I, I think that's uh, yes, in some species, yes. So I think that's, for example, the poly, uh, we see that also in, uh, with the temp, with respect to temper, temperature treatment. Uh, yes, I think that's uh, in some population, especially those populations that they, those fish, they don't know, they don't have the ability uh, to move uh, long distance or those fish that uh, they don't have a pelagic larva uh, phase, right? So like a poly, for example, or uh, like the clownfish. So yeah, I think that they need to have enough standing genetic variation in order to cope with this extreme environment. Not only CO2, also temperature, to be honest. Is answering your question? Yeah, thank you. That, that's great. That's a great news, actually. So thanks. You're welcome. All right, I will ask the next question. Um, 
Davide, you mentioned that food quantity increased at the vents. Um, were you able to say anything about the food quality also um, at the vents or just the uh, quantity? Ah, sorry, but yes. Um, I would say we didn't check the quality of like food resources at the high tissue vents. But um, uh, what I can say is that, uh, of course, the biodiversity of fish there is um, lower compared to the control condition. So also um, the species have much less competition in terms of resources. So the species can benefit of these increased resources for, for, for themselves, for the benefits, for the fitness, sorry. So uh, we, we, we can say that the indirect effect of the simplification is very important for that because, because when we look at different studies under laboratory conditions, it's hard to say because we cannot understand, for example, the food availability under these conditions. I hope I answered to your question. Yeah, that was great. Thank you so much. Um, let's see. Sam, do you have another question or did you mean to put your hand down? While we're waiting for more questions to come in, um, I'm conscious that Goa On is a network of people at many different levels of their career. So we have some very engaged early career professionals. Um, some may be on this call or listening to this presentation later. Um, so Davide and Tim, I'm wondering if you can share a little bit about your experience getting involved in the natural analog community or in ocean acidific acidification research. Um, and if you have any words of advice for uh, early career folks who are looking to get into this space. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, um, so the question is, uh, how to get into involving this? Well, you know, natural analog is something that's uh, just recently start, right? So we start to learn, we're still learning how powerful they can be to, for us to understand what would be the, uh, you know, the adaptation potential to marine organisms. Um, the, the, the thing of natural analog is uh, uh, that sometimes are not easy to reach uh, because they are isolated, uh, they are not you know, they are volcano, most of them, and or very isolated thing. So I think that's an uh, uh, initiative like Icona uh, is one that's, uh, I, I really, not because I'm part of, but I, I really think that's, uh, uh, is a very good one because it connects different natural analog, analog uh, researcher, and then you have a network, right? And among this network, like David is an example. David is the first Icona a postdoctoral scholar, uh, and I think that uh, if someone wants to get into um, study natural analog, I think that contacting Icona will be uh, a good start because there is several laboratories all around the world, and all of us have always uh, place to accept a student, for example, uh, because again, logistically studying this side it require uh, some effort. Uh, and uh, be part of our network uh, in different locations, that's help a lot. And uh, yeah, I think that that is my suggestion. So go on, could be another one, for example. But I know at Kona we have a specifically postdoc position of, of students. So we have another student that's the first uh, uh, Icona student, uh, joint student, Kalum, which is here in Okinawa, but is also in Shimoda. Uh, and he will have the opportunity to explore several national analogs. So I think that's uh, be part of uh, this kind of international network when it comes to study uh, national analog is very important because of the logistic and the ESO to get there. Sorry. I, I agree. The, I, will, I will second you on the importance of networks like Icona and Goa on, and that sounds yeah. like a really wonderful opportunity. Uh, Davide, do you have more to add? Ah, yes. What I can say is that, uh, I mean, uh, I'm here since eight, uh, seven months, but uh, I met too many researchers from different parts of the world just in a few months. So 
I think it's also a very good opportunity for a young researcher that try to want to do some science, but also uh, it's a very nice opportunity to join other uh, university and like uh, visit some very beautiful places. And also, I mean, uh, I, for now I'm, I feel so, I feel so good about that. So I really want to suggest people to join. That's an excellent, that's an excellent advertisement. Um, I don't see any other questions from our participants. So Tim and Davide, thank you so, so much for these wonderful presentations and for this conversation at the end here. Um, I would also like to thank our audience for, for being here and joining us for this edition of the Goa on webinar series. Um, and just for a small advertisement, our next webinar is scheduled for December 14th at 3 p.m. UTC. You can join us then to hear Dr. Margaret Ogandare and Dr. Mohamed Ahmed speaking about carbon cycle monitoring in the polar regions. Um, and you can also stay up to date with our future webinar announcements and more on the Goa on website, on the Goa on Twitter feed, or by signing up as a Goa on member. Uh, thank you all so much, and we will see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thank you.